Good afternoon, everybody. Once again, I'm Jacqueline Lucchupi with the Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation. And I'd like to thank you for attending this year's virtual transportation <laughs> forum and expo. As you may know, this forum is collectively organized by Tennessee Department of Environment and Conservation, the Tennessee Department of Transportation, and the Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition. The forum typically takes place as an annual conference where attendees share and discover projects that can reshape what is possible in transportation and mobility. In 2020, the Sustainable Transportation Forum and Expo will be held as a free online webinar series that will promote research, technology, planning, and policy developments that improve transportation efficiency, reduce vehicle emissions, and address the mobility needs of all. We are so thrilled by this year's virtual turnout, which is a testament of the interest and commitment to these topics in our great state. Today's webinar on freight and transportation and logistics is the first entry in the 2020 virtual webinar series. Our moderated discussion with our expert panelists will explore the short-term and long-term expectations for the growth of freight transportation in Tennessee including how different actors across the state contribute to the future of sustainable, efficient, and economical freight movement. As a reminder, this webinar is part of the forum's 2020 virtual webinar series discussing today's most pressing sustainable transportation topics. For your convenience, we've put in the registration, uh, we've put the registration information for the webinar series in the chat box. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few WebEx housekeeping items so that you know how to participate in today's webinar. You are all muted upon entry and will remain muted throughout the webinar to reduce background noise and associated audio feedback. We've also deactivated audience cameras to help with webinar bandwidth. To submit a question for Q&A, which will follow today's uh, speaker presentation and moderated discussion, you can submit a written question into the chat box to our behind the scenes webinar, WebEx host, Mr. Caleb Powell. You can submit those questions via the chat box at any time during the webinar. He will hold those questions until the Q&A session begins at the end of today's session. So now that we're all oriented to the format of the day, we thought it would be fun and an engaging to kick off the conversation with a lightning round of three quick poll questions using Mentimeter. For those that haven't used the platform before, it's very easy. It's just a three-step process. You go to menti.com in a new web browser window or on your phone and enter the code that's on the slide which is 27780069. I'll let everyone uh, take a moment to pull that up and we'll be able to see the live, live results from people. All right, 68 coming in strong. All right, you guys are a smart bunch. 68 is, uh, was the correct answer, and 12 of you got that. So we're going to transition to the next question. U.S. freight railroads, on average, move one ton of freight uh, more than X miles on one gallon of fuel. I will be honest, I got this wrong. I was wildly off until I saw the correct answer. All right, 370 and 470 are neck to neck. The correct answer is 470 miles. Pretty, pretty impressive. Okay, one last question. Um, so we'll 
We'll forward to the last one, which is two-thirds of freight shipped in the U.S. was shipped less than blank miles in 2018. If we were really on the ball, we'd have some, some Jeopardy music playing right now. All right, the correct answer is 100. So you guys are smart, a smart bunch. You guys overwhelmingly got all of the right answers. Okay, so thanks for your participation in those poll questions. Your answers provide a good backdrop for our conversation today and let the presenters get a better sense of the audience and your current thoughts on the on frank transportation. So now, without further ado, I'm pleased to introduce our moderator today, uh, Dan Palmy, who will introduce our panelists. Dan is the associate, um, the assistant chief of freight and logistics of the Tennessee Department of uh, the Tennessee Department of Transportation. In his role, he provides leadership on issues of rail, water, and freight and high, highway freight. His division serves as a liaison between TDOT and freight stakeholders in an effort to find opportunities to improve access for existing freight and um, appropriately prepare for the projected increases in freight as it moves in and out of the state. The primary focus of areas for the division include water, short length railroads, the Section 130 rail program, rail inspection, highway freight and technology, freight advisory committees, and updates to freight and state rail plans. Dan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, I thought what I what I'd do is give you a, give everyone a brief overview of the freight and logistics system um, in Tennessee. And I think that we are truly blessed when we look at the assets that we have from not only the short term, the past, the short term, but then in the future. So obviously, if if you're looking at how freight moves from an environmental standpoint, we'd love everything to be pipelines then waterways, then railroads, then highway, which is the questions and all the smart people on the on the call got, and most of them were related to highway and roadway because they are they are the number one modes in Tennessee. If you look at it from a perspective first of pipeline, what is the pipeline situation in Tennessee? We have a great pipeline network at all our major urban areas, in case you don't know. Number one, the colonial, the, the pipeline there, the Mississippi River serves basically the petroleum there in the Memphis area or West Tennessee. And then we have a colonial pipeline and a couple other ones that come up basically through Atlanta, Chattanooga, and then diverse from there to either the Nashville area and Knoxville area. So we have a great system when it talks about pipeline. The next mode that I want to talk about is the waterways. If you look at the waterway system, once again, we're, we're very blessed in this region. We have not only the Mississippi River as a major corridor, north-south corridor, but we have the Tennessee River and the Cumberland River that separate the city. And if you look at it from a lock perspective, the biggest two projects from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are going to be finishing in the next couple of years is the Kentucky Lock and the Ch uh, Chickamauga Lock that, that both serve Tennessee. So we're looking good there for the future, both near-term and short-term. From a railroad perspective, and most of our speakers today are going to be talking from a railroad perspective, we have six of the seven class ones that operate in Tennessee. Of the short line railroads, we have 21 short lines with 16 rail authorities that we give basic grants to from that perspective. Highway network, if you think of it, we have great north-south highways. We have I-69 that will connect Canada and Mexico that will be is a, is a long-range goal of the TDOT to, 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 uh, to help in that. We also have I-40, which runs the 420-something the mile length of Tennessee. If you look at even, even loops in the, in the city, if you're talking about Memphis, we have the 240 loop, and then we have the 269 loop that encircle Memphis. In Nashville, we have Briley Parkway or 440, and the 840 loop that bypasses the southern part. In Knoxville, we have other, other ways to traverse the city, and the I-640 I that goes around Knoxville is another option. So I really just wanted to set the stage. Right now, what I'm going to do is we're going to have three speakers. I will read a short bio beach uh, for each one. I'll turn the floor over to them. 
And then what we'll do is we'll give them about six to eight minutes to talk about what they want to talk about when it comes to uh, sustainable transportation in the state of Tennessee. So the first speaker is going to be Kevin Walker. He is a professional engineer registered in 25 states. He has served as the principal engineer of CSR Engineering since its founding in 2007. He started a civil engineering firm with a focus on the railroad industry. CSR Engineering has kept the original focus while growing to provide a wide array of transportation and municipal services. Throughout his consulting career, Kevin's primary focus has been on railroad and transportation related projects with a particular emphasis on the short line railroads in Tennessee. His experience has included the inspection of over 1,000 unique railroad bridges from New York to Arizona and engineer of record on more than 60 new railroad bridge designs. Mr. Walker, Mr. Walker also serves as a construction manager for the Music City Star Commuter Rail Project in Nashville, Tennessee. Kevin, would you like to share your comments, please? Sure. Thank you, Dan. I'm grateful for the opportunity with you all today. As you might have gathered from my bio, my interaction with sustainable freight is all primarily with the infrastructure side rather than the vehicle or locomotive. In particular, my experience has been with the freight and passenger railroad infrastructure projects and both Class 1 and, and Short Line Railroad. Um, just an example, some of the projects CSR Engineering is currently involved in the design and construction inspection. Eight railroad bridge replacement projects in Tennessee, Texas, and Indiana. Um, 24 different rehabilitation projects, uh, again, from Tennessee and Alabama and Pennsylvania and Texas. Uh, we have four new industry spurs currently under construction. Uh, these new spurs are new connections or expansion of connections for industries uh, all within the state of Tennessee, uh, giving them better access or new access to uh, shipping and receiving by rail, as well as uh, several projects that are rehabilitating over 100 miles of track. These projects all run the, the full gamut of funding from private funding uh, from the railroad or indoor industry. Uh, the local authorities and state and federal agencies. In addition, we're working with the Federal Surface Transportation Board on an environmental assessment of the possible new line between the city of Tennessee and this one in Texas. So, for this background, I focused on my information anyway for today's panel um, on rail freight. So, rail transport is all about moving freight with efficiency. That includes the efficiency of personnel. Uh, a single two-person crew of just a conductor and an engineer can move 8,800 tons of freight on an average train uh, on a class one railroad. And then, you know, with an average speed of 50 mile an hour, that's almost 220 tons per hour per person. Um, that can be uh, achieved. For comparison, the uh, truck at going you know, 20 tons of freight and 65 mile an hour, that's, that's 1,300 uh, tons uh, per mile per hour per person. So, um, of course, it also means fuel efficiency, not just personnel, and that really is where rail excels. That's the, we saw that in our quiz question coming into uh, the panel today that um, freight by rail is, it can get 470 miles on just a single gallon of diesel fuel, uh, that's four times more efficient than trucks. One of the most interesting things about that is 40 years ago, that number was about 235 miles. So it, it is, uh, that fuel efficiency has doubled. In the, uh, in the last 40 years, which is exciting thing. So that, that lower fuel consumption uh, leads to lower carbon emissions um, overall. Uh, despite handling a third of all inner city freight volumes, rail accounts for just 2% of all transportation related emissions. And it's just 10% of the freight moved by large trucks to be moved by rail instead. And the annual fuel savings will be on the order of 200 million gallons, and emissions will fall by over 17 million tons. Um, an equivalent of approximately 400 million trees. So, uh, again, as far as moving moving freight over land, um, the rail is definitely an environmental friendly uh, method. So, uh, we look at that uh, with that efficient mode of transportation. It's critical that the infrastructure be developed and preserved to allow and encourage as much freight as possible to utilize rail. This includes large movements of a single commodity, but the other car unit trains of grain. And as well as just opening up the rail market to small industries that we could ship or receive single car loads. Um, some of the methods used here uh, in the last 40 years on that, they, they stand that market, the intermodal, uh, which is shipping in the Connex containers. Uh, 
allows us to use the, the freight to come in via ports and we go to the mobile yards like the effect does here in Nashville or in Memphis and also the Southern Sea and BSF also in Memphis. This allows the freight then to deliver the final mile to the truck. Uh, another avenue is the Eli Short Line Road. Um, these brand, former branch lines of class ones are, are third party operated um, short line railroads. It just says their name says that they actually operate 29% of the total route miles in the United States. And one out of every five rail cars shipped in the United States for the short line is an origin of destination. So these are very uh, critical to the rail network as well and, and open the rail network up to a larger audience uh, of industries to ship. So in Tennessee, there are 21 short line railroads with approximately 700 route miles. Uh, they interchange with five of the seven platform railroads we have in North America. Um, that's just where I have spent a large part of my career over the last 20 years. And uh, we're very fortunate that Tennessee through PDOT has, has had a first class program to help fund the rehabilitation modernization of these lines and keep them viable and keep them as an option for industries to ship on. Thought of while we're talking sustainability of freight and, and infrastructure of rail, um, we point out railroads are notoriously for notoriously to use for thinking long term. A uh, 100-year-old railroad bridge is not an uncommon phenomenon. Uh, we have many that we're responsible for maintaining and for seeing functioning well into the future. So, in many places, the railroads of Tennessee are operating over the same road that is very structured that they were built on prior to the Civil War. So, with that, I look forward to our panel discussion today on uh, sustainable freight transportation logistics. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin, for those views. Some interesting statistics that you uh, that you went over there concerning the short lines and the different freight modes in there. So, our second panelist is Amanda Marufo. She has been with the BNSF Railway for 10 years. She graduated with her master's degree in environmental engineering from the University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and went directly to work with the BNSF. Amanda has experience with facility environmental compliance, including hazardous waste disposal stormwater permitting, field prevention plans, stationary source air permitting, and implementing an environmental management system. In her current role, she has responsibility for BNSF's mobile source air and climate programs, which include regulatory and compliance issues related to mobile sources. She is also involved in monitoring, tracking, and obtaining grants, and has a passion for new technology. She is a member of BNSF's Battery Electric Initiative team and enjoys working with other passionate people at BNSF to advance technology and reduce emissions. In her free time, she enjoys running and spending time with her 18-month-old toddler and six-year-old first grader. Amanda, would you please share your uh, opinion on sustainable transportation in Tennessee? Sure, absolutely. Dan, can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. All right, awesome. So again, my name is Amanda Marufo. I'm the Senior Manager, Environmental Operations at BNSF. And I wanted to take some time this afternoon to talk about um, one of BNSF's sustainability initiatives, which is our battery electric initiative. We have a team that works on assessing, converting diesel equipment over to either hybrid or all electric options. Um, and we do the assessment at various locations with various equipment, um, taking a look at the economics. So some of the pilots that we're doing right now and we'll roll into next year, we are piloting an all-electric side loader, which think of a really big forklift. Um, we're also piloting an all-electric drayage truck, two hybrid rubber tire gantry cranes, and what we affectionately refer to as the star of the show, but our, our battery electric locomotive that is gonna operate in a hybrid concept. So basically meeting line haul train that's gonna be paired, your battery locomotive will be paired with diesel locomotive. So what this means is we're incorporating, just think of a locomotive gutted filled with batteries. Um, we're going to incorporate this on a line haul train and optimize where and when we use the batteries in order to get the most fuel reduction possible. So our battery electric locomotive uses regenerative braking to charge the batteries. So think when you're braking or you're going downhill, you're charging the batteries. 
when you have a, a very hilly up and down terrain, that's where you're going to get the most benefit out of your batteries. But if you have a very flat terrain, your batteries can be depleted within 30 minutes, and then you're just essentially dragging dead batteries, which is extra weight, which can worsen the fuel efficiency of the train. So it's very important that you optimize when and where you use the batteries. Um, our pilot is going to start in Q1 of 2021, and it's going to run in California from Stockton to Barstow and back and forth for about three months. We're also in the process of piloting, which we've been for a while now, since 2017, but all electric yard hostlers, so they're like the little trucks that are in the intermodal facilities that move the containers around. Um, and that pilot, as I said, started back in 2017. And all of these are in California. And the reason why is because that's where the bulk of the incentives are. They have grants for equipment, grants for infrastructure, and then on top of that, they have their low carbon fuel standard where you're able to get credits for using electricity from the grid or renewable power versus diesel fuel. We're really trying to get some projects underway outside of California, but the economics are very, very tough. And we're realizing we can't do it without significant grant funding. You know, you look at the cost of the equipment, it's typically two to three times more than the cost of a diesel equipment. And then the cost of infrastructure we're seeing is typically seven figures. So we have not seen infrastructure installation cost less than a million dollars in any of the assessments that we've done so far. And if the economics don't work out, it's ultimately not a sustainable project. You have to go back to the triple bottom line. Remember, it needs to be economic as well as having social and environmental benefits. We're really hoping to be able to, in the future, do an electrification project in Memphis. We have a very large intermodal facility there, but even we're staying with even 50% funding electric is not favorable over diesel. So it's really tough. The economics make it challenging, but also the market itself makes it challenging. You have to remember the rail industry, at least for locomotives, has two major equipment manufacturers and a fairly small market for locomotives. It's about 40,000 locomotives in North America. And when you compare that to, say, the light duty sector, which has 270 million cars and over 30 OEMs in the market, more players in the market are going to be mean more competitiveness, higher likelihood of costs going down, and a quicker advancement of technology. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, when you're talking about climate change and becoming a more sustainable company, the concern and the focus is carbon emissions. And in terms of carbon, rail is the clear winner. You know, you look at converting truck, truck freight movement to rail, and you're able to reduce carbon emissions just by doing that by two thirds. Because of our ability to pull so much freight on one gallon of diesel, we're inherently the number one efficiency choice for land transportation. And I'm happy and excited to talk more and get into some more details later in the panel. So thanks for having me, and I'll hand it back to you, Dan. Thank you, Amanda. I know that facility at, uh, on Shelby Drive in Memphis has some great electric cranes already that yeah. have, have been truly impressive and, and yep. truly the intermodal terminal in the state as far as technology. So glad to hear about the updates and what you're doing in California as well. So the last, uh, the last speaker or panelist is going to be Amy Kosanovic with the uh, Tennessee Department of Transportation. She is a freight planning supervisor and works for the Freight and Logistics Division. She manages all the facets of freight planning for the division, including updates to the multimodal freight plan, the state rail plan, and prioritization of freight projects. Amy's unit also oversees the Short Line Rail Rehabilitation Grant Program and Rail Connectivity Grant Program. She graduated from the University of South Carolina in Columbia, South Carolina with dual bachelor's degrees in history and English with a master's degree in public administration. Amy's prior experience with the South Carolina House of Representatives and with the Tennessee State Senate for nearly 10 years, she worked as a research analyst for South Carolina Department of Commerce 
conducting industry analysis, labor market analysis, proposal writing, and tax incentive analysis, aiding in the recruitment of advanced manufacturing and research development companies to South Carolina. She enjoys living in Tennessee with her husband, Rick, and their two daughters, Katie and Allie. Amy, would you like to give a few minutes on uh, your views of sustainable transportation in Tennessee? Sure. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate the time to meet with you all today, and it's an honor to be here today. And I just wanted to say, within the Freight and Logistics Division, I manage freight projects of all types, including highway, which looks at modal diversion, rail, and waterway projects. So Tennessee is uniquely um, positioned to have those rail, uh, those waterway projects be a barge, and that's something that we really want to look at as well as a division. Within our division, our goal is to place the right freight on the right node at the right time. Currently, the majority of freight in Tennessee, as many have already said, moves via truck. But where possible, we are looking to create projects that would provide nodal diversion, utilizing other modes than truck to move freight. One of the most powerful statistics out there shows that for a thousand trucks full of freight, you can move that same amount of freight with 216 rail cars or just one barge. Both rail and barge are more energy efficient than trucks. Barges can move one ton of cargo, 647 miles per gallon of fuel. We've already been tested on the rail number, which is 470 miles per gallon of fuel. And when you look at a truck, they can move a ton of cargo 145 miles per gallon of fuel. From an environmental perspective, if you compare the major modes and their emissions, identical amounts of freight create 154.2 CO per million ton miles by truck, only 21.2 tons by rail, and 15.6 tons by barge. So if we can shift even a small amount of freight from truck to rail or barge, we can provide choices for freight movement that are sustainable, help reduce congestion, on our highways by modal shift and reduce emissions. So what type of programs are we managing to create these, um, to make uh, freight more sustainable? So for highway projects, where possible, we are encouraging projects that will reduce our freight bottlenecks on interstate highways, and we want to provide better traffic flow and less congestion. And those projects can vary from interstate or interchange improvements to truck climbing lanes to intermodal facilities that create more mass last mile deliveries via freight. We also interact and receive applications from companies that would like to test vehicle platooning in Tennessee. For rail projects, as already been mentioned, we do manage two programs that encourage more use of our short line and class one rail networks in Tennessee. The rail preservation grants are provided to the 16 short line railroad authorities in the state that manage those 21 short line railroads. And these preservation grants provide maintenance and rehabilitation funds to keep freight moving from Tennessee's most rural areas connecting with various Class I railroads. Our Rail Connectivity Grant Program is a competitive program that funded rail projects with the purpose of preserving highway maintenance for modal diversion, jobs, and bringing more business to Tennessee, which is the economic development impact. During the last round, all of the eight grants awarded brought capital investment and jobs to all of the communities that they served. Several of the projects also had dual rail and barge connections. For barge, our division is involved in the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway Development Authority for the state of Tennessee. The authority develops barge economic development projects all along this vital waterway to encourage freight movement and diversion. And finally, from a planning perspective, we manage the statewide freight and multimodal 
um, and rail plans that study how to best prioritize freight projects for the future that are sustainable, create economic development opportunities, mitigate congestion, and move Tennessee forward. And that's all I have at this point, Dan. Thank you, Amy. So it's, it's kind of interesting as I, as I sat back there and listened to the three panelists, Kevin, Amanda, and Amy, you know, I guess two, two takeaways here that I wanted to bring up that obviously all of them talk about sustainability, freight movement, the huge amount of, of freight movement moving in Tennessee and on their network. But to think of it from a sustainable standpoint, you know, what if, what if let's just say tomorrow that, and that all rail went away and all that additional heavy traffic was going on on the roadways, what would we look like? And then also the second thing is kind of the economic development um, points that, that kind of surround all this. Whenever there is rail enhancement to a, say, a, say whether it's a short line or a class one, think of what it does to the community around it. If you look at a short line railroad that, that Kevin mentioned in rural Tennessee, all those jobs come with it and it just kind of enhances that county. But the same point, if you look like the BNSF in, in Memphis, it's in the middle of the warehouse district in Memphis and seeing, think of all the jobs that come with that. So that's just a, percep a perception of mine as it comes to freight. Obviously I'm the freight and logistics guy, so I have a passion for that. So what I thought I'd do is we're gonna go over a series of questions. We got about 45 minutes left or 40 minutes left and then Caleb's gonna take over and look at, he's, he's monitoring your questions. So we really wanna hear from the audience. So if you have questions for any of the, any of the speakers, uh, today, please get your questions in. Caleb will take over and kind of talk about the, the questions and itemize it. And then I'll, uh, we'll wrap up a little bit between myself and Jacqueline as we go forward. So what I'd like to do is I'm gonna rotate the questions because I gotta keep the panelists on their toes. So we'll start off first, uh, and this will be, this first question will be to all the panelists. Uh, Kevin, I'll, I'll ha ask you to speak first. But what are the short-term and long-term expectations of growth in the freight transportation nationwide? In Tennessee, growing VMT, added congestion, certain markets more heavily impacted than others. Can you address that question? And then we'll rotate from that to Amanda and then Amy. Sure, Dan. Um, and I, I love future prediction uh, in, in this uh, economy and, and uh, just the situation we're in these days even politically. So it's, it's hard to know what our trade policy is going to be here in a few months, let alone in the future, but uh, in thinking that, nonetheless, thinking of growth, um, everything, every study that that we've been exposed to, I think, is looking at freight growth is somewhere around three percent um, nationally. Uh, we don't see anything trending down. And then, as we think of Tennessee, um, you know, you, you tie that growth, as mentioned, to you know whether it's population or trade policy or individual commodities and, and the issues they have. Um, you know, obviously it varies from market to market, but with the growth that Tennessee's seeing, even compared to the United States as a whole, seeing, seeing a higher growth rate and, uh, you know, middle Tennessee in particular, uh, with, with an extremely high growth rate, you know, it, we don't see that number being below 3% and, and likely higher than that. And again, um, each commodity, as you mentioned, certain markets more heavily impacted. There's, um, you know, over time we see we have wild swings of that. The, the rail industry in particular right now is, um, obviously seeing a major major focus or major changes in the coal market and what's getting shipped there. So that's one thing that will, will definitely affect on the, in the railroad industry anyway, the, the market and um, the capacity that we have to, to move freight. So um, VMT, I, I did think that was interesting in VMT. Well, one of the, the factors of Tennessee, and that's one of our experiences even in getting the Music City Star going is um, that uh, we, we here tend to love our vehicles. Um, so I think we are ninth in the U.S. right now as far as uh, vehicle miles traveled per capita, uh, with some, the number being somewhere around 12,000. Um, and that number doesn't seem to be going down, um, even as the rest of the, the country perhaps is a little bit. So again, I see, see high growth, see, see that congestion that comes with that vehicle as, as Middle Tennessee and Tennessee as a whole grows. And uh, we tend to hold on to that uh, hold on to our vehicles, congestion is going to grow and therefore freight congestion with it, uh, particularly on the highway. So um, that's kind of a quick outlook from my perspective anyway, Dan. Thank you, Kevin. 
Amanda, do you need me to repeat the question? It's kind of long. Or what are the short-term and long-term expectations for growth of freight transportation nationwide? In Tennessee, growing BMT, added congestion, are certain markets more heavily impacted? Yeah, so from the from my perspective, you know, what I've seen in the rail industry, we generally follow the trends of the economy. And this is really true, you know, when you look at the last six to eight months of this pandemic, you, you can see that play out. The economy has de decreased significantly, so has our volume and the goods movement industry in general. So back in April, uh, March, April timeframe, our volumes decreased to 2018, 2019 recession levels. And then June, July timeframe, we did see volumes start to increase, particularly in the consumer product category. So think of you know, your e-commerce or your Costco, Walmart goods. And we're slowly starting to see our volumes rebound to what we would consider normal levels. In terms of Tennessee, particularly Memphis, you know, where our intermodal facility is located, that's expected to grow. Freight is expected to grow in this area. Um, again, particularly for the consumer product category, which is our intermodal business. You know, as we see intermodal volumes increase, what's gonna happen? On-road trucking is gonna increase. The question is, to what extent? You know, businesses have a decision to ship their products via rail or via truck. And we're seeing more and more of our customer base take a very close look at that comparison between truck versus rail in terms of carbon emissions. Because a lot of these companies are setting public carbon goals and trying to reduce carbon in, within their supply chain. And BNSF, we've created a carbon tool where you can calculate your rail emissions versus that same freight being moved via truck so you can compare the two. And we're seeing um, that a lot of our customers can reduce their carbon emissions by two thirds by shipping via truck or via rail versus truck. So it's a pretty powerful tool in terms of decision making and we work with more and more customers every day to take a very close look at that. Thank you, Amanda. Uh, Amy, the same question? Sure. So as you look at the different statistics out there on freight growth and population growth, a lot of these, again, were prior to COVID. But um, as you look and project out to 2040, some of the statistics I've heard were that freight, um, truck freight traffic is predicted to grow by, say, 35%. Um, rail by 49%, barge by 32%, and air by 263%. And Tennessee is predicted by 2040 to have a 90% population growth. So that additional population is going to need additional freight, additional products. So growth is definitely a good assumption for Tennessee as well. As far as um, you know, certain markets more heavily impacted. I thought about this because we have all those freight assets, the six out of seven class one railroads. Um, we have the fifth largest inland port in the state and the largest North American freight related airport in Memphis. The freight logistics market is going to continue to grow. Just as Memphis is a hub for freight logistics, there are going to be other areas in Tennessee that are going to see that. And as you think about automotive and the presence of Volkswagen in Chattanooga and now the fact that they're going to build electric vehicles in Chattanooga and with the fact that 88 of the 95 counties in Tennessee have an automotive presence, you're going to see automotive and advanced manufacturing markets continuing to grow as well. Thank you for all those comments. Boy, y'all threw out some great statistics, and I was just uh, I was just reading today and, and updated staff or, or yesterday actually about how they're saying a prolonged peak season that with with the advent of COVID and and maybe not any more Black Fridays per se, but e-commerce they're predicting it to go well into 2021 as far as freight flow. So it's going to be no lightening up on the uh, freight and logistics is the is the message I'm hearing. 
So the second question for the panel, and uh, Amanda, I'll go with to you first, and then Amy, and then Kevin, is what are Tennessee's biggest opportunities for the proliferation of sustainable freight and logistics? What are the responsibilities of different actors, i.e. state, government, private industry, personal consumer, when trying to make freight transportation more sustainable? Sure, Dan. So I would say um, TDOT, biggest opportunity, and it's going back to our, the truck versus rail concept, is to really understand the value of those avoided emissions by converting to rail, you know, in terms of also reduced highway congestion, decreased maintenance and repair costs on your highways, and of course, lower carbon emissions. And I'm going to sound like a broken record, but conversion from truck to rail can offset carbon emissions by up to 75, 75%, which is huge. Um, if you look at the state and state and federal government, that's really going to be responsible for allocating R&D dollars, research and development dollars for funding the development of new technology that's going to take to get those lower emissions. And then utilities. Utilities are a huge part of the solution. You know, being able to roll out, make ready infrastructure programs to help cover the cost of installing infrastructure. And then the private sector is going to be responsible for identifying how best to transport their goods, doing a full assessment of their supply chain, and going with that low carbon option, which is usually rail. And we're seeing more and more of our customers actively doing that. And then BNSF and other transportation companies, as well as the original equipment manufacturers, are resp responsible for working with the funding agencies and developing and implementing these concepts to advance new technology. And that's something that BNSF has been very aggressive with when the opportunities are there and the economics make sense. Thank you, Amanda. Um, Amy, the same yeah. question. What are Tennessee's biggest opportunities for the proliferation of sustainable freight and logistics and responsibilities so, of I, such actors? Sure. I'm going to sound like a broken record as well, but I think it's worth continuing to bring up these topics. Modal diversion is one of our biggest opportunities as a state to attempt movements from truck freight to rail. And we also, again, have those natural assets with the Tennessee and the Cumberland Rivers and the Mississippi to move via barge. I don't think we can count out barge as a player in this game. Also, when you're looking at the responsibilities of the different actors, what I see personally is as a state DOT, we can encourage modal diversion. We can bring those players together private companies, economic developers, MPOs, different groups together to discuss, okay, what's going to be the best way to move that right freight on the right mode at the right time? And I really think that we can engage all of these players. I think relationships are very important and getting out of silos to try to engage those players to come to the table and talk about that. I love what Amanda said, too, about looking at your supply chain. I think that's awesome. Thank you. Kevin, same question. You got any thoughts on it? Sure. Um, and again, just mode diversion being, being my thoughts as well, um, as we've hit, you know, within each mode, there's obviously opportunities, but uh, mode diversion from truck to rail being being where my focus was. Um, and really one of the practical answers to that, I think, and is something Dan, you and I have talked about before, but that is, um, you know, one of the ways that the, the railroad industry went and basically has doubled their fuel efficiency over the last four year, 40 years, one of, one of many, but is that they've gone to larger cars, uh, heavier cars. Um, and that's one of the things that our short lines in the state uh, have not all gotten there where they can handle those loads yet due to bridges and and track conditions. So as that is upgraded and, and those cars are made available, it does it does two things. It makes their operation more efficient, which is uh, more sustainable, but it also then opens up those those particular lines uh, to shippers on the line to be have access to, to those same heavier cars and better rates. And of course, economy and, and economics of that move is always going to be 
the main, one of the main drivers on the private side for for that diversion. So I, I think and really TDOT has, has been playing a, a key role in, in making that conversion and, and I think continuing that and seeing that through to the end is, is going to have a big help um, here in Tennessee. Okay. Thank you, Kevin, for those comments. Uh, once again, I'm, I'm amazed y'all certainly thought out these questions and answers, so I appreciate that. Uh, next question, I'll start off uh, just going in the same order, Amy and then Kevin and uh, Amanda. Uh, how does energy efficiency get worked into freight planning technology adoption? And how does sustainable freight projects become a reality in Tennessee? So, again, thinking about being intentional in this process, I think the first step that Tennessee needs to take is we need to look at from a legislative perspective do we allow these new technologies to happen in Tennessee? And we need to take those steps to appropriately plan and enact legislation that will make them um, the ability for them to move forward. We also need to choose, you know, these new projects and technologies like what the NSF is doing. We need to put ourselves out there as a candidate to be a testing ground. I think that's something that's very important and that we, again, just need to be intentional with doing. I think how they um, happen and become a reality in Tennessee, again, communicating. We all need to be at the table discussing and brainstorming how sustainable freight projects can become a reality. I really want to be involved with that as a DOT in the future and being at the table. Okay, uh, Kevin? Yeah, Dan, I guess the thought on this similar to what Amy just mentioned and, and then also as we think about the freight planning process and um, think about the, like new line studies that we're currently working on, you know, some of this is is is, uh, is baked in there, I, I guess, in a sense, when we do an environmental impact statement or environmental assessment and and look, you know, efficiency. It may not be weighted as much as maybe it should be, but it is considered in there as, as we study possible different lines and what will be the benefits of that. So to, I think to some extent it, it's in there, again, from the infrastructure standpoint, from my viewpoint, um, but I, I think the focus could definitely be sharpened on that. And one of the other things as we, we consider sustainable freight projects, um, one of the ones that came to mind, it's a project in its infancy and may never see ground, but you know, if there's opportunities for even dual modes on some of these projects, um, thinking even uh, even if it goes outside the world of freight, uh, but it, overall sustainable projects, uh, we have a, a particular bridge that we're looking at, possible you know, rail as well as pedestrian, and those two things obviously have to be kept separate, but yet the project can have some, some synergy and, and definitely uh, if we can work things like that in partnerships, it, it helps them become a reality. Um, so I think seeing more things like that in the future and the teamwork involved to, to make those happen is, is where we need to be. Thank you for that, Kevin. I know that uh, in Memphis there's a very unique pedestrian bridge that uh, obviously is going over a Class One railroad near the University of Memphis that, that historically has been a, an, uh, uh, a nightmare ready to happen, and now they've built this pedestrian bridge where even though pedestrians and rail doesn't mix, it, it definitely now has safe and a way for the students to get back and forth from campus, so kind of a unique perspective there. And, and ongoing best practices is so important. So Amanda, to you, how does energy efficiency get worked into freight planning technology adoption? And how yeah. does sustainable freight projects become a reality in Tennessee or on your network? So in terms of efficiency, BNSF is constantly measuring, tracking, and implementing efficiency initiatives. Because for us, running our business at peak efficiency in order to best serve our customers is the ultimate goal. And then couple that with being able to do that at reduced cost, which usually, if you're being more efficient, you're able to reduce your cost. So unfortunately, though, new technology and peak efficiency don't always go hand in hand, especially at the beginning. So when you implement a new technology, there's something called the bathtub curve, where you start at a very high failure rate, 
and it slowly decreases as the technology improves. So knowing this, for sustainable projects to become a successful reality in the state, they need to be allowed to develop over time, especially when we're talking about the medium duty and heavy duty sector, because it's very use case specific, and then it's also a much smaller market. So secondly, at the end of the day, you need to have some sort of grant funding. So going back to that R&D funding that I was talking about earlier, you know, in order for a company to dive into new technology that may hurt their efficiency at the beginning, and it's going to cause costs, capital costs to increase, you need to have grant funding readily available to, up, to offset those increased risks and increased capital costs. Very good comments. Uh, at this point, I've got two more questions I could ask the panel, but Caleb, how are we looking on questions? Do you want to ask a few questions from uh, from what the audience wants to hear? Yeah, right now we've got about five questions. Uh, so uh, if you don't mind, I might just ask uh, one or two, then we can jump back to some of your questions and then, uh, and then jump back to finish off uh, some of the audience questions. So, um, we were talking about, I'm trying to pick one that sort of has to do with what we were um, just talking about. Let's see. So um, is, there in, is there an effort to expand rail in the U.S.? I think there are a lot of miles of unused rail lines. Should we invest more in rail infrastructure? Does anybody want to take a stab at this on the, the panel? So I, I can – go ahead, Jim. Uh, I can give a quick overview that I just heard today on a Council of Rail Transportation of AASHTO, and they actually said that 96 municipalities since 2004 have basically uh, reopened a track that was not being formally used, and they expect another 20 by 2030. So that's just a stat that I thought was a tremendous of, of getting back in the community uh, to reopen some of these lines that historically have, have not not been open for the past few years. So it's a very interesting trend and I thought it was so unique that I actually wrote it down from a call that was just this morning. So um, Amanda, with that, please please give your comments. Yeah, so I would say absolutely we're looking to expand, but it really co goes down to what's the demand, what's the customer demand, um, and if it's there, then we work to best serve our customer, and that usually includes some type of expansion. Um, but again, going back to the economy, the ebbs and flows with the economy, if the, if the demand is not there and the customer need is not there, then we're not going to expand just, just to expand. Um, so it really all comes back to the trends of the economy and how we can best serve our customers. Kevin or, or Amy, you want to take any more stabs at it, or you want to go to the next question, to Caleb? Well, as a, just, go ahead, oh, Amy. Yeah, I was just going to mention, so recently the Port of Cape Landing did win a build grant for an expansion of a rail spur that will connect to one of our short lines, uh, potentially, in Tennessee, and that could create additional business. And I know Kevin's been working with KTRRP. So, Kevin, did you want to mention that? Sure, sure. And that's, uh, I think, as a as a railroad engineer and consultant, frankly, we're always going to be for more investment. That's self-serving. But um, we do see some good things happening that way, um, as Amy mentioned, with the build grants uh, that uh, seeing some rail projects being awarded, as well as uh, the Federal Railroad Administration is, is now giving out some Chrissy grants that uh, are uh, helping fund some some projects that are much needed to, to again to keep the the you know particularly the short lines uh, viable and, and growing. Um, and, and again, we do have some new studies uh, in Tennessee, as we mentioned, the Union City looking up to Hickman and making connection there. Um, but uh, we're grateful that we're, we're seeing a little more interest from the federal level on some grants. And, and, and as we mentioned here a few times, Tennessee has, has done a great job over the years with, with some grants to, to keep the short lines active. And that's a, that's a key part. This, it's the right of way is if we have it and can keep it active, um, even um, 
keep it viable. It's easy to grow it. It's a lot harder if that that right that right away is is gone. So um, that's that's a key part of rail growth to me in Tennessee is is keeping the lines active and and not uh, not losing them because they don't come back easy. Caleb, you want to throw out another question? Yes, sir. Um, so this is more of a, of a comment, but I, I, it's sort of interesting to me, and I was going to see how the, the panelists, um, you know, if they had any comments regarding this. It says, railroads may grow, but there will still be a need to offload from rail to truck. Rail does not give you the last mile delivery to warehouses. So um, it wasn't really a question, more of a comment, but I was just excited to see how, how the panelists, um, what they had to say about that. 100% and that's a, that's a very good point to bring up and it just goes to show, you know, that drayage truck last mile portion is just as important and just as a, a key piece of the supply chain that, you know, the customers who are moving their freight have to take into account that what does that last mile portion look like and then from a land planning perspective, you know, that's why it makes sense to have a an intermodal facility close to, you know, those warehouses and those transload facilities. So so you're able to minimize and shorten that that last mile dry move. I totally agree. And I would say too, think about those last mile moves. This is where electrification of your smaller trucks can come into play. I think that's where it would be more feasible, and I know that Amanda's talked about, yes, it has to make sense economically, but those are studies, and I know a lot of, you know, last mile delivery companies are, are already engaging some of those electric vehicles, so I think that would be where that would be useful. And two, we have had companies um, even come to us about last mile using other modes like the e trikes and those types of things within the urban core. I think the the key is last mile or even last 10 miles, but not last 500 miles. If we can <laughs> find that right balance is the key to that. So. Caleb, you want to do one more question or you want to keep on going? Sure, yeah. Uh, we got three more right now. And then so what, what I'll do is I'll just do one more and then we can jump back into some of the, the some of your questions and then we'll finish up with these and if there's any more that come in. So. Um, this this one it says, uh, what are the primary factors that make rail so much dramatically more fuel efficient than trucks? So it's our ability to carry one ton of freight on one gallon of gasoline, 470 miles. I think that was one of the the questions on the the pre um, beginning before the panel. I mean, it's our it's our fuel efficiency. We're inherently more fuel efficient because of our ability to have such long tra trains and heavy carry such heavy such heavy freight. Kevin or Amy, you want to add to that? Yeah, I was just going to say, you know, we can't discredit how much congestion does bring down the fuel efficiency for. Um, your freight truck modes, because if if they can move more efficiently and do more of a, you know, base speed, not where they're stop and go, that's definitely playing into the fact that they're not as energy efficient. Yeah, just to add to that, there's there's a lot of momentum when we have 8,800 tons, tons rolling and can keep it rolling instead of the stop and go. That's And it's really comes right down to that. Spoken like a true engineer, Kevin Walker. Very good. All right, so I'll, so. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll ask another question, and then uh, we'll go back to, to Caleb to, to maybe finish us out. So just keeping up with the order, Kevin, you're going to take first stab at this, and then Amanda, and then Amy. How does freight planning take into account new technologies and vehicle fuels? Uh, think of platooning, heavy-duty electric, and hydrogen vehicles, et cetera. What happens to the freight sector if these technologies and fuels are adopted? Kevin, you want to go first? Sure, Dan. Um, and, and some of that I'm going to I'm going to 
I'll let the other panelists jump in on that because the, the fuel is, is definitely not my area. But uh, thinking of the, the new technologies and, and adopting them, one of the examples we have here recently, and it's a little bit of a maybe a hybrid example or, or not fully developed yet, but the railroad industry as a whole has just implemented what we call PTC, which is positive train control. Um, and, and it was very much not a sustainability initiative, it was a safety initiative um, to make sure that uh, trains were, were heeding to the signals out there and, and re just reduce the, uh, you know, operator error um, in that and, and add to train safety. But in doing that, and I, the jury's still out a little bit on how much efficiency we're going to see, if any. Um, I think some different railroads have different opinions about that. But by going to that new technology, there, there's a theory anyway that we're going to be able to, uh, you know, maybe more, get more capacity out of a single line. Um, by the way the operations are handled and, and by bringing that uh, train control into it. So I think that's a good example of, of some of these. It's, it's definitely one, uh, any new initiatives like that, uh, that's been mentioned already by Amanda as far as the cost. I think PTC was about $14 billion to get that implemented here over the last few years. So the, the implementation of these new technologies are very expensive. Um, and it takes a while to, to work all the, the kinks out of them and, and get it to where we, we see the efficiencies. We're see, seeing some of the safety numbers already, but to see the efficiencies, uh, perhaps it's going to take a little while here. So. Thank you, Kevin. Amanda? Yeah, so regarding new technology, you know, whether you're talking about lithium-ion batteries or LNG or even hydrogen, it, they're all the same in that it doesn't happen overnight. And that technology needs time to develop and grow. And for the medium duty and heavy duty sector, more OEMs need to be in the market in order for the technology to become better and more competitive and to finally see costs decrease. And again, it's very tough with locomotives because there are only two major equipment manufacturers in that space for locomotives, Progress Rail and Wabtec, formerly GE. And again, it's a small market, 40,000 locomotives in North America versus, say, your light duty sector, which has 270 million cars and over 30 OEMs. So it's gonna take longer, it's gonna require more financial resources to advance the medium duty, heavy duty sectors, including locomotives. And an issue that's arguably more important than the technology aspect is the economic side of it. So in order for us to get a project approved, even if it does have your social and environmental benefits, the economics have to make sense. Electric or hybrid even has to be more favorable than diesel because we're going to do the comparison of the two. And it's not a, it's not a sustainable project if the economics don't make sense. Great point. Uh, Amy, you got any thoughts on it? Well, I I'm was sure strictly kind planner. of thinking, yeah, I was thinking about it from our perspective. I mean, obviously, as the division at TDOT that houses, if someone wants to do vehicle platooning testing in the state, then we would naturally interact with those companies. Um, I do think that what we have to think about is if any of these new technologies are adopted, how it will affect, you know, our current fuel tax structure and, you know, how we would move forward in that. So I think we need to be proactive as we're planning and as we're thinking about as these new technologies are implemented, how is it going to continue to support transportation infrastructure in the U.S.? Tennessee is not the only state that's going to be affected by that. Everyone is. So I think we have to think about from a planning perspective, all the facets, um, the economics, the um, the way that we would implement, again, going back to legislation and, and making sure that we have the legislation in place that would be, you know, would allow things to be implemented. So that's what I have to say. Thank you, Amy. Uh, the last question I have, and then we'll go back to Caleb, is, uh, and we'll start off, uh, Amanda, you take first stab at this, and then Amy and then Kevin. How can freight logistics be addressed in a system-wide perspective, focusing less on individual vehicle impacts and focusing more on how different freight elements interact with each other and the state at large? 
So I think this all comes down to policy. And a lot of, I, I'm in agreement with what Amy is saying, you know, regarding legislature. You have to focus on how to provide those incentives to new technology to help get over these hurdles and barriers that companies face related to the capital costs. Um, some of the key things that we see in our economic studies and where we're able to see favorable projects for electric, it really comes down to two main things, being able to incentivize low carbon fuels. So for example, California has their low carbon fuel standard that offers a credit for using the electricity from the grid or renewables um, if you have it. Um, versus diesel, so you get an ongoing credit for that. And then they also have the utilities, the IOUs have a make ready infrastructure for a grant program um, that where they come in and they work with the customer and help provide them the solution to, um, to install that infrastructure for, for whatever electric equipment that they have to charge. So we're seeing those things that are unique today in California, but those are really the key things that are helping these projects get approved and, and move forward and advance the technology. Thank you, Amanda. Amy? I would just echo again what has been said before to really having those intentional conversation as, as different groups and as different parties to the table and trying to bring everyone together. I think that's where from a system-wide perspective, we're going to see um, more success in the future with getting these projects implemented. Any, quote, any thoughts there, Kevin? Yeah, I, I guess just any time you're working, you're looking at something system-wide and you have a system that's so many different moving pieces of, of different entities, it it's, takes the teamwork that Amy's mentioned and uh, the coordination and then, as been mentioned, it's uh, in the end, we, you know, the corridor studies are wonderful. Look at you know possible modal you know diversions and uh, we, in those to make sure that we're attributing the proper benefits and, and value to to that modal diversion. But even after that, uh, it just the will and uh, the, the legislative work that has been mentioned already to to help fund those. It's uh, it, 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 in the end, it, it it takes funds to make these happen. Great point. Caleb, you want to, let's check the chat box again and see what other questions that you have from the audience. Yeah, sure. So um, we had one that says, locomotives are already hybrid powered vehicles. How can efficiency be increased? Get off mute for a minute. Um, so <laughs> what we're doing with our pilot, with our battery electric locomotive pilot in hybrid consist is Hopefully, it's projected to increase fuel efficiency by 10 to 15 percent, um, which is huge when you're looking at the fuel consumption of a line haul locomotive. So as I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the intro, talking a little bit about the battery electric locomotive, you know, it, it basically takes a locomotive, guts it, put it with, fills it with batteries, and then you pair it with your other diesel locomotives in your hybrid now, now hybrid line haul contest. And every time you are either breaking the train or going downhill, you're able to charge those batteries. And then when you're able to optimize the use of the batteries, that's when you get that fuel reduction from the other diesel locomotives that are in that line haul contest. And I'm not sure if I mentioned this in the beginning, but this is, we haven't started the pilot yet. Wabtech is our project partner on this. They are right now building the battery electric locomotive at their facility in Erie. Um, and it's going to be transported to California at the end of this year, and it'll go into pilot demonstration mode for about three months in Q1 of 2021, running from Stockton to Barstow. And then might just jump in. The other the other way to do that is just like in a vehicle, um, along with the technology, it's it's how you drive it. Um, so, you know, for the for the trains, efficient railroading includes things that looking at you know your lines and where where we have passing sidings and where they can be lengthened and can we move can we keep all eight thousand or ten thousand tons rolling 
um, and make a pass or do we need to sit there and idle for an hour while we're waiting on an oncoming train? And so working on efficiencies of the infrastructure as well will, will definitely help that fuel efficiency. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, Caleb, you got another question? Yeah, so um, it says, given efficiencies of transporting goods via river, does TDOT do any work to promote or facilitate more freight transport via river barge, especially considering Tennessee River, Mississippi, and connection to uh, Tom Bigby? Uh, for instance, creating creation of ports, funding of barge loading slash unloading equipment? So, uh, yes. Do you want to I do can, that first, Dan? Probably. I can probably answer that one better uh, better for the panelists. So uh, I'm actually the vice chairman of the Tennessee Tom Bigby Waterway Development Authority. The, the chair is actually Governor Lee. And uh, so when it comes to, you know, we look at everything that could be economic development for the waterway. As, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, you know, that is a true, you got to really understand that the chick lock, Due to due to issues, and it's been and it's literally been decades since uh, they found the aggregate that was destroying. It was basically building up concrete within the the lock walls. So a lot of business from an economic standpoint would not locate above the chick lock because you never knew if that was going to give out, and then you, your whole uh, uh, business model would be kind of messed up because you would you could not rely on the water mode is your transportation if, if the lock goes away and then it's done. So the same thing with the Kentucky lock. It, it really is, we are positioned very well for the future. It's amazing how much freight moves on the lock. Um, I mentioned in, in my remarks about pipeline and fuel petroleum moving a pipeline, but the reality is the pipeline's about at capacity. So where's that moving? Well, it's moving on barge barge, uh, rail, and highway due to the network of how it works. So we don't really have any per se grant programs that are building individual ports. However, we are a strong supporter of different projects. And I'll give you a great example. Uh, the Tennessee Economic and Community Development was just awarded a project in Port of Cates Landing. Port of Cates Landing is in Lake County. It's one of the poorest um, counties in Tennessee. And it's basically a waterway on the Mississippi River. Uh, and what they wanted and what they received out of a build grant was a 5.5 mile extension of rail into an industrial park. Everything that all the panelists have talked about is this is a trimodal opportunity where you'll have water, you'll have rail, and you'll have highway infrastructure to help out the community. As I talked about, with that comes jobs, with that comes uh, additional business. With that comes more sustainable practices as we, as any way we can shift from the highway to the water, to the rail, to the pipeline is always good for every Tennessee and every, every person in the United States. So I hope I answered that question, Caleb, and sorry that I spoke instead of the, uh, the panelists that we had. Amy, do you have any other comments? I think you pretty well covered it. The only thing I would say is we did also engage with the Army Corps of Engineers in the Tennessee Division as well last year, late before um, COVID hit, and started talking with them too about different um, projects that would be barge related along our river systems. So. Next question, Caleb. Yeah, so um, what is one thing that we could do to help sustainability in, freight and logis in the freight and logistics world? Incentives, grant programs? Panel, would you like to grab this one? Um, I, I would say one thing you can do is look at your policy. Does your policy and your legislature allow you to have the right grant programs because a lot of times, you know, you you do have you do have grant programs out there. For example, DERA. But if you look at how that grant program is set up, it is not set up well for conversion to all electric or even hybrid. It's set up well for turnover of to a cleaner diesel. 
So typically your cost effectiveness on those grant programs are gonna be pretty low because your cost of a new diesel is comparable to your, the cost of the old diesel. But when you look at the cost effectiveness for um, conversion to all electric, it's much higher because of those higher capital costs. Your cost of the equipment for, for all electric is usually two to three times more than the diesel counterpart. So that really increases your cost effectiveness. So yes, grants, that's a huge part of it, but it's specifically how those grants are, the guidelines and how those programs are built and if they're really set up for conversion to this new, more expensive technology. That's, a, that's an important piece as well. Kevin, do you I have would, any thoughts? Yeah. Or, am I, or go ahead, Amy. Yeah, I was just going to say, from an incentive perspective, um, the questionnaire mentioned that I, I would like to see how we could incentivize um, maybe modal diversion. Again, it would take some thought, but I think it would be well worth the effort, even initially kind of at a grassroots level, to see if there's a way that we could incentivize people from moving uh, from truck to rail um, or barge. Kevin, I you have was, sure, I, I, I think that was well covered. I, you know, just in, in the grant process, and there are many grants, and as Amanda mentioned, it's a little bit of how, how they're, how they're written, written, but the, uh, there's always incentives and, and scoring mechanisms in there. Um, it's, a, it's a matter of this being a priority um, to that grant if, if, if that's the, the will of the group. So um, I, I really just, I think it's in the, in the way that the grant itself is written. Very good. Caleb, you got you had one more question I saw. Yes, sir. Um, so I, I thought I left this one for for the end because I thought it was um, a good way to to end the panelists um, and, and and get an input from from everybody and and for yourself. Uh, it says, "What upcoming Tennessee freight projects are you most excited about?" So I'd like to hear from the panelists and and from you, Dan. Um, well, I can jump in. This is Amanda. Um, I'm, you know, we've got, as uh, mentioned earlier on the call, we have a really first class, one of a kind intermodal facility in Memphis. And one of the things that I would like to do is figure out a way to convert our yard hostler fleet. So the small trucks that operate within the facility that move containers around, um, convert those over to all electric. Since we really have some good work under our belt with yard electric yard hustlers out in California, we've seen that it works. The technology, we're really working through that bathtub curve and we're getting to a good point with the technology. Um, and then we have other electric as Dan had mentioned, we've got wide band, electric wide span cranes at the facility. So having a fleet of all electric yard hoppers would be just one more benefit for the facility um, and then the community that's around the facility benefiting from the reduced emissions. Kevin, do you have any thoughts? Yeah, I guess the one that comes to mind, we have a um project out in uh, West Tennessee out of Jackson um, that uh, just was received a four and a half million dollar Chrissy grant from the Federal Railroad Administration and it's going to allow them to do some upgrades on their line to the, the heavier cars, the 286K cars that we discussed and uh, that project is, is underway and it's uh, exciting to, to see it come to fruition, that, that uh, investment being made by federal, state and local and private uh, funds, and, and it'll be exciting to see the fruition of that and, and hopefully the industry growth along that line. Amy? So to think about the projects that we've got coming up, um, we do have, a, and this is more of a highway related and truck related, but we have a way in motion project that we're developing that will hopefully give us the data that we need to see um, freight movements as well as help with maintenance and enforcement 
of um, trucks in the state and making sure that they, um, we don't have too many overweight vehicles. Um, that will help us from a highway perspective. Then, you know, I'm always, I'm excited about the bill grant that the Port of Cape Landing received. I'm also excited that for all of our short lines, we're about to finish up a needs assessment to where we'll really see what type of rehabilitation needs to occur to make those short lines even stronger. Many of the short lines do need bridges rehabilitated, and that's something that we hope to in a future Builder Christy Brown, we, we tried this time and we didn't make it this time, but hopefully we'll be able to secure more funding for those types of projects. Thank you, thank you. And I guess, uh, Caleb, since you asked for my opinion before I turn it over to Jacqueline for the closing comments, you know, I'm really excited about all modes. When it gets down to it, some of the numbers that uh, Jacqueline and put on there for the trivia going on, and, you know, if we could reduce, let's be honest, the easiest way to move freight is by truck. But if we can reduce and just shift that one or two percentage points to pipeline, to waterway, to railroad, you know, that's what really makes me passionate. I'm excited for the future when, when I talked about the locks and what that could do from an economic development standpoint. But then also with short lines, you, you mentioned we had a bridge bundle that we tried to do that was very creative. We did not receive, we did not get it. But it was, it was maximizing the amount of leverage with federal funds to really help, as Kevin alluded to, a lot of these bridges are over 100 years old. I, I actually inspected one the other day that was built in 1906. And if you think about it from that perspective, that is amazing. Uh, but anything that we can do to, to, to help the overall movement, because if we wake up one day and everything is moving via truck, eventually we're going to be so congested and sustainability just will not happen. So that's the part that excites me. Um, at this time, I'd love to thank the panel. I, the, I was totally amazed at some of the stats that you all threw out. You really thought about your answers, the questions from the audience, uh, truly remarkable. I appreciate all your time, especially you, Caleb, from taking ownership and running a very smooth uh, as host of this meeting. So I appreciate that. Jacqueline, with that, can I get it back to you? Absolutely. Thank you, Dan, um, Amanda, Amy, and Kevin for this insightful discussion. I think we're all coming away um, learning, knowing more about freight logistics than we woke up this morning, including myself. My, my background is in residential energy efficiency, so I found the conversation really fascinating about energy efficiency in, in transportation. So, so thank you. Um, to our audience, our forum organizers from the Tennessee Department of Environment Conservation, the Tennessee Department of Transportation, and the Tennessee Clean Fuels Coalition, thank you for attending today's webinar. We hope you can join us for the rest of our four-part sustainable transportation webinar series. The future sessions will be October 20th, November 2nd, and November 17th. Same time, same platform. The webinar topics and registration information are once again posted in the chat box. We also have a SurveyMonkey link in the chat box that takes you to a quick just three-question survey regarding today's topic and speakers. Your feedback greatly helps us shape what next year's event looks like. So thanks in advance for completing that survey. Um, and with that, this webinar is adjourned. Thanks so much for attending and have a terrific day.